The year is 2014. The day is May 20. It's been nearly two months since a new update has been released for Geometry Dash. However, the players were hyped as Robtop had shown a lot of things through previews. Look at these pictures. Some new icons and some new gravity balls are showcased. What's more interesting though is this new background in the picture. Up to this point, every level had this square background. Moving into other previews, you could see another new gravity ball with even more backgrounds and more decoration types. Along with this are some new ground types. However, players started wondering what this picture meant and what these things do. Well, on May 21st, many players would boot up Geometry Dash to see the new level of the update, Electrodynamics. And finally, players could interact with these objects. Going back to the online interface, you can notice that you have an option to get a rainbow trail. Ooh, glowy. Apart from that, the already established creators of Geometry Dash would keep making new levels utilizing what was now known as speed portals. The double speed portal was utilized by Liod in his new level Lights and Thunder. The triple speed portal was utilized by Darnock in his new level Darnock Dynamics. It was also used as decoration. And the 05 times speed portal which actually made your cube slower was utilized by Majako in his new level Dark Matter that had decoration highly based on the available Geometry Dash cubes of the time. Look, it's me. This portal represents the normal speed that the community had been accustomed to at this point and it was still utilized in many levels. Something I should mention is that briefly after the release of Update 1.7, Geometry Dash became the number one rated game on the App Store. This attracted the attention of quite the unlikely individual. You see, this is where YouTube becomes a bigger part of the story. Gaming had been on the rise and it was spearheaded by the content creator PewDiePie which had everyone else beat by millions of subscribers. PewDiePie had done videos on Impossible Game before, so on May 22nd, he would release this video. How's it going, bros? My name is Pewdiepie. Today we're gonna play Geometry Dash. It looks pretty- oh, it comes like characters. This is me. His name is Solid. This video would bring a lot of attention to Geometry Dash and the community had a period of growth. More Geometry Dash YouTubers started joining the fray. Neptune had become a content creator showing complete replays of all of his levels. A little bit earlier than that though was a content creator known as Aeon Air who is skilled in both playing and creating. He was simultaneously in the top 25 as both a player and creator. When Aeon asked Darnock to showcase one of his levels, Darnock responded saying that the level was too difficult for him to beat and Darnock then advised him to make his own channel. That's where Aeon Air's YouTube channel would spring up where he would show replays of many different Geometry Dash demon levels. Some of the demons were his own. The important ones being Time Pressure, which ended up being a level in a map pack, and To the Stars, which was a pretty challenging level for its time. Aeon Air would build up a slight consistent fanbase consisting of 5 players. While Dade Pro was already an established creator, what Aeon didn't know is that he was about to help start the careers of 4 dormant creators that were about to become massive influences in the Geometry Dash community. These 4 creators were Glitter Shroom, Evasium, Rob Buck, and Viperin. After being tipped off about the Touch Arcade website by Darnock, Aeon would utilize this website to tell Robtop of these players, and soon they would all have their first featured level. They would all keep building onto their success with new creations that would pick up rates and features. These players would then start the second ever Geometry Dash clan known as Team Geometrified, the first clan mainly consisting of members from the Geometry World Forum. A lot of members of Geometrified would also be part of a chatting group that became known as Team Moonchat. It was then that the very formation of how to produce a Geometry Dash level would be changed forever. A level known as Velocissimo was released onto Dade Pro's account and it would become the first ever collaboration. A collaboration is when several players get together to work on the same level. In this case, the players were Aeon Air, Viperin, Rob Buck, Liad, Dade Pro, and Menagroth, a mysterious player with seemingly his only influence being his part in this level. Geometrified would continue growing as the members were starting to collaborate with each other on individual levels to a smaller scale than Velocissimo. Aside from what was going on in Geometrified, the players of the Geometry World Clan were still extremely active. One of these players was Funny Game, which was on the brink of making one of the most important levels in Geometry Dash history. This level would be fittingly named Funny Game Holiday as it was definitely a gift to the community. There had been a minor focus on effects in Geometry Dash before, but this level would bring effects in Geometry Dash up to new heights. The effect used in this UFO part would be dubbed the Equalizer effect. 
Even though there was only one color channel available to Geometry Dash players, Funny Game made this work. By stacking multiple color blocks above each other, he would give the illusion of multiple colors. Combining this with other effects like block pulsing and this cool Space Invader art made it a new type of level. Funny Game would become the pioneer of effect levels in Geometry Dash, levels that aim to impress you with new and unique effects. While many players wouldn't be able to pick up on this style of creation yet, it became a much more important style in the future. Funny Game also released a level called Vector which had an interesting use of shadows and an interesting use of colors. Then there's this interesting level called Lonesome, which is one of the first levels that I think actually tells a story. Through the entire level, you're making your way through some of gray areas and grim environments until finally you see a single flower, which then makes the level burst into color. Another GW player was Neptune, which since 1.6 had been straying from his comfort zone of only making a second version of Robtop levels. After releasing Electrodynamics V2, he would release his hardest level yet. Deadly Clubstep is a complex labyrinth of vicious monster fangs, arrows of misdirection, extremely difficult timings using the newly implemented speed portals, and monster faces. Lots of them. As two months of evolution flowed through the Geometry Dash servers, Robtop would start giving previews of the new updates. It was clear that 1.7 would come to an end soon. However, Majaka was still rapidly producing levels that were well received by the community. Antimatter was the sequel to Dark Matter. There is also Treasure Mine, a pretty difficult level that makes you feel like you're in an enclosed space. Which you are. What would really pique the curiosity of the community was when Majako made a level called 8 Bit Core. It had extremely good looking effects for the time, somewhat taking inspiration from Funny Game Holiday, however, the level would be deleted. Another event that would happen before the release of 1.8 was the uprising that was going on in the leaderboards. No, not that one. Sari's fine and comfortably ahead, being the first player to not only reach 10,000 stars, but also the first player to reach 11,000 stars. Where our focus lies is the creator leaderboard, where the half a year reign of Darnok was about to be threatened. Ever since having the first rated level, Darnok had been number one on the leaderboards apart from a small takeover by Mask. Darnok would not only take this position back, but he would stay over 10 creator points ahead of everyone else. He also had a second account named Darnok2 that had over 20 creator points and made levels like Beautiful Chaos into the grave. The only other thing this account was used for was a creator contest. After this, the account lost its save data. By the way, talking about creator contest, it started to be introduced around this update and it's a competition where creators would create a level, usually under certain guidelines to get awarded some sort of prize. Aside from all this though, ever since 1.5, Darnok would start being caught up to in creator points by the Korean creator Zenthic Alpha. By the time Darnok had released Shock, the rest of the old guard that had been in the top 4 for so long had been completely dismantled. The seizing of activity in Mask, Cody, and 99 Geometry Dash's level releases caused them to be completely replaced by Zenthic Alpha, Experienced Dawn, and Jelt. Darnok would then release a level called Stage X. It was an unfinished level that attempted to mix all the stages. It still got a rate, making it the shortest start level in the game, sitting at a little over 10 seconds. By the time Darnok had released his last 1.7 level called Dream, he had already been taken over by Zenthic Alpha and Experienced Dawn. They both became the first players to bypass 75 creator points. With Gel quickly closing the gap, Darnok was ousted out of the top 3, but he would stay at 4th place because there wouldn't be any other competition. What's that? Oh, it's a new preview. One of the previews Routop would give to the community was this picture. It shows a drop of water, an ember of flame, and a hexagon. Piecing this together made the community assume that the next level would be called Hexagon Force, named after Waterflame's song. Their assumption was confirmed as on the 7th of August they would boot up the 1.8 Geometry Dash client to find Hexagon Force. There is many new things to talk about, new types of block design, more decoration, and this hexagonal background. The most important thing was the addition of slopes which was previewed multiple times before. Slopes completely changed the dynamic of gameplay and they were a welcome addition to Geometry Dash, although we still don't know what this portal does. That's right, it creates a second version of yourself that jumps exactly when you jump, holds exactly when you hold, flips gravity when you flip gravity. Although, I should definitely mention the new 2 player mode. While it wasn't used in Hexagon Force, it would start being implemented in online levels like Dragon Force. In levels like this, whenever you went through a dual portal, you would use the left half of the screen to control one of your icons while using the right half of the screen to control the other. For players on the Bluestacks mobile game emulator where you played the game on PC, you would use a mouse in a spacebar. 
after the release of 1.8, Neptune would be back up to his normal version 2 shenanigans, releasing a second version of Hexagon Force. The version trend had really caught on, and players would start making their own versions, like Chevrolet's Hexagon Force V1 and Noriega's Hexagon Force V3. It is now that I should mention another quirk of the dual portal. There is two main types of dual gameplay, simple symmetrical gameplay where people mainly focus on one icon, and then there's the wide and complex world of asymmetrical gameplay. At its fullest potential, asymmetrical gameplay is the hardest gameplay possible, with you having to focus on sometimes two completely different game modes at once. The potential of this idea could theoretically result in extremely difficult gameplay, but in the entirety of the 1.8 update it would be somewhat underutilized. During this update, Geometrified would stay somewhat under the radar while Geometry World was popping off. Funny Game would continue making interesting levels, the first of which being Checkmate, a level that has a mostly red and black chessboard theme. It's also some of the first experimentation with 3D-like visuals. Then there's Atlas, which is a demon that uses the new glow blocks in interesting ways, such as these glow gradients and these shadows. There's also this part, these gemstone type block structures will be used more soon. The third level Funny Game would release was a level called Hologram, which had this cool retro style block design. Majako would also start making even more of a name for himself. After releasing Hello Demon, he would restart his core series with a level called Transcore. There was also Theory of Extreme 2, inspired off of Noxperian's deleted level. He then expanded the core series with Metalcore, and a revived version of 8-bit core. It was clear that the core series' design philosophy was to have extremely complex block structures. This would be explored more in the later updates. What was really interesting was the events occurring in the dark corners of GW. Neptune had released a graveyard-themed level called Necropolis. This became one of the hardest demons in the game and it was able to do so by forcing the player to be able to beat specific timings and have quite the fair share of memory. Then there was what was going on with Seri. He would make the GW version of Velocissimo. This level was called Collaboration. It features important creators like Jackson Dorbe. Dorbe was a creator that was gaining mass recognition for their series Dorbe Basic, a series of simply designed levels that was easy for the average player to pick up. Some of these levels even made their way into map packs. Other players such as Ark, Xstep, Lanov, and Xnail would also be involved. However, it wouldn't be a Seri level without input from Seri himself. That's where the community got its first taste of rated Seri gameplay. Seri's last part is disproportionately harder than the rest of the level and it would just be a preview of what he was about to release. You see, Seri wouldn't only collaborate with these players, he was about to release a collaboration with Neptune and it was about to become the most infamous move of their entire careers. Seri posted a level called Red World a level where he made all of the gameplay while Neptune helped with all of the decoration. Although, this wasn't your average extremely difficult level. You see, Seri would be the only player to realize the dual portal's darkest secret. Using this knowledge, he would be the second ever player to make a game mode. I'll explain how something like this is even possible. In dual gameplay, when one icon flips gravity, the other one also does. Using this knowledge, Seri would put a gravity ball on the top to tap the blue orbs. When you do this, the gravity ball on the bottom of the screen has the capabilities of flipping gravity mid-air, which would create what we now know as the swing copter game mode. Of course, as if this level's gameplay wasn't hard enough, this new game mode addition threw everyone in the community for a loop. How could he have done this? How could Seri be so skilled? Well. It's not like a verify hack was out of the question. After all, Silent Club Step by Salem was able to slip through the cracks, and this level was borderline impossible. Robtop's suspicion of Seri was at an all-time high and Red World would stay unrated. This meant that going into 1.9, Stereo Demon S would be nearing its fifth update of being the hardest level and Seri would remain at the top, thousands of stars ahead of anyone else. Update 1.9 was about to release and there's a lot of previews to go through. The first one is just a picture of a bunch of cubes just sorta of vibin' though. The second preview confirms the addition of the ability to make block structures look 3-dimensional. There's also this preview which hints at new icons, new block structures, these gears which work similarly to saws, and this new portal. I wonder if it's the swing copter. Then some nice cryptic codes to help you with predicting what the new levels will be. This part shows the blast of an explosion and a processor. This harkens back to Waterflame's song, Blast Processing. And this part? Well, I'm just gonna spoil it. It's Theory of Everything 2 by DJ Nate. This makes this the third update to introduce more than one new level. Then finally we get more context to the first picture which shows that players can get custom music from the Newgrounds website. It's the best website Rob could use without being crippled by copyright debt. 
So these cubes are not just vibing to any normal music, they are vibing to gaming music. Finally, I could use Fire Aura in my online Geometry Dash level. Alright, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. First we have to talk about the two official levels. First there's Blast Processing. It's interesting, but I'm starting to get curious at what this portal does. Yes, it's Robtop's Dart game mode. It would also be used in Theory of Everything 2, Robtop's second ever demon level. Theory of Everything 2 introduces a lot more things that are invisible like these saws, these mini spikes, and these mini blocks. Along with that are some new block designs that haven't been shown yet. The parts that stick out the most is this ball maze and this pleasant ship part. If you had a keen eye, you might have noticed the color diversity in these levels. That's right. 1.9 increased the amount of color channels that creators could use up to a whopping 4. Hey, at least it's more than one color channel plus the player colors. One more thing about the dark game mode. It may have seemed like a completely random choice, but this was actually entirely inspired off of one level made in late 1.8 called Wave Wave. By Darnock. That's right. He would add a second game mode concept and this time it was a full length level. He would use the UFO game mode to click on blue orbs the entire way through the level. People picked up on this level being the inspiration and basically everyone forgot about what Robtop named it and opted for calling it the wave, based off this level's title. If you analyze it, these game modes are actually pretty similar. They both traverse through primarily slope-like structures and they both die if they touch basically anything. Robtop's nice little addition would be that the wave isn't even safe on flat surfaces. That's right, this thing doesn't even have to touch spikes. This wave is a fragile little thing, and the mini wave is a small fragile little thing. The normal wave and mini wave are surprisingly different. The normal wave goes up and down at a 45 degree angle while the mini wave goes up and down at a 75 degree angle. And this thing is small. Really, really small. Anyways, when 1.9 came out, Neptune would still release the traditional version 2s. However, now there was a lot more freedom and people were no longer bound to the same old Rob Top songs. No creator made this more apparent than Funny Game. Funny Game was really quick on the draw and the level that he was about to release would once again be another massive innovation in the art of Geometry Dash effects. This level was called Revolution and it would use the custom song Infernoplex by Dimrain47. It would start off like most other levels with some extra things thrown in like this glow, these stars, and this utilization of four different colors. Everything would change when players would discover the second half of this level. First would be this extremely cool red blur effect flowing through these block structures. Then there's this part which shows the full potential of the new color channels in quite the amazing way. Then this gravity ball part shows these diamond blocks pulsing with this glow effect. Finally, the level would end with a ship part. This level would help popularize effect levels and creators would start experimenting with how well they can maximize the capabilities of the editor. Funny Game would of course keep going and he would make a level called Rainbow Dust, a level that became famous because of its drop. During this part, there's a lot of different good looking backgrounds. There's also this part with the rainbow blocks. These pulsing diamond structures were also pretty cool. Funny Game's third 1.9 level would be Reincarnation. This level would utilize blur blocks and also establish that Funny Game was really serious about this black background with colors thing. There's also these torches, and this cool pulsing background. And finally, the two effects that this level is most known for. This part introduces the parallax effect. The last part of this level would have this really cool static effect. Another creator that would rise up during early 1.9 would be a creator called Devere. Devere made two levels that would utilize effects similar to Funny Game. The first level was Lucid Dreams which would utilize the signature colorful objects flashing in and out of the black background. However, Devere had some really interesting effects, like this and this. Lucid Dreams would have a sequel called Illusion which would be known for its pleasant colorful backgrounds and this static effect. Innovation and decoration would also come with gameplay innovation. A creator called Incendium would make the longest rated level in Geometry Dash history. This level was called Tetrix. Of course, the ability to utilize custom songs meant that you weren't limited to the usual 100 second level cap before the song faded out. The wave would also start being utilized in many levels and difficult wave parts would start being made. The most famous early example of this is this wave part in Decode by Wreckage. Although, many players wouldn't be shaken by these levels. In fact, they were the ones doing the shaking. You see, around the same time 1.9 released, Geometry Dash for Steam also released. This would be major as it would allow for a more optimized platform for both Bluestacks and mobile players. Especially the latter, which would deal with slight delays and slight lag spikes. 
the release of the Steam Client would give birth to a new generation of Geometry Dash, and this new generation would give death to the unslayable demons of the past. Ice Cream by Cyclic would be slayed by a star grinder known as Zobros. Necropolis had been slain by Zephyr and Elite. Twilight Step version 2 by Black P2S Fool would also fall to Zephyr. Even Deadly Club Step would fall to Wreckage. Not even the formidable Stereo Demoness was safe, as this level would fall to a player called Crack. But it wasn't because this level wasn't hard enough for anything. You see, even after the release of 1.9, Majaka would continue releasing levels and as he got more and more popular, people started to question how he could have released such a difficult level that early on in his career. As Majaka felt the walls closing, he would make the decision to nerf most of his levels. Stereo Demon S would be hit the hardest and after that it was easy pickings for Crack. This meant that through all this time only two demons remained, Alphabet X and Ice Carbon Diablo X, nearly forgotten levels of a bygone era. Seri's account had slowed down in Stargain massively after the release of Red World, which was a level that was heavily affected by the 1.9 update. Due to an oversight in coding, Routop had downgraded the color slab to merely a color block. This meant that interacting with this block in the future updates would just make you phase through it. This meant that it was now impossible to pass the 2% mark of Red World. This sole glitch would prop this level up to mythical heights. The only view the community got of this level was Neptune's practice run of 17 attempts and Jack the Froster's practice run of several thousand attempts. Seri's star count went to a complete halt around the same time that he beat the Eerie of Everything 2. At this point, Seri had accumulated 14,100 stars. People were wondering who would beat him. That person would be the player and creator Lunar Sim. He was able to pass Cyclic in star count and was even able to score some creator points on the side with his SIMG factorial series getting rates and features. Lunar Sim would eventually catch up to Seri's account and take him over. Finally, since 1.6, the seemingly unbeatable Seri had been taken down once and for all. The creator leaderboard was still highly contentious. Since getting his first rated level in 1.7, Viper had become the fastest creator to release levels by far. During the 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9 update, Viper had the record for the most creator points gained, partly due to him being able to collaborate with other creators which would allow for faster level releases. Around the time 1.9 released, Viper had passed up Darnock and became a member of the top 4. He would then steamroll through Jelt and Experience Dawn. His final challenge would be Zenthic Alpha. And finally, he would upload a collaboration with the player that beat Stereo Demoness, Crack. This level would be called Unity and it would be the final boost that Viper needed to pass Zenthic Alpha and become the first ever player to get 140 creator points. While Viper was on top, it wouldn't be a walk in the park. Zenthic Alpha was still a formidable foe and in the next few months they would switch leaderboard positions multiple times, both being far ahead of the third place creator, Experienced Dawn. While all of these events were going on, another player was rising below everyone's noses. He had beaten somewhat notable levels like Doomsday 2 by Neptune and Valley of Dreams by Nubas. He would also be Aeon Air in a race to see who could be the second person to beat Deadly Clubstep. His name was Riot. Riot's Deadly Clubstep video would start to get attention across YouTube. While most other Geometry Dash YouTubers will only post sheer replays, Riot would stream himself with a face cam, adding more variety to the exponentially expanding YouTube scene of Geometry Dash. While the top players of the time were trying to pick at Ice Carbon Diablo X and Alphabet X, the levels would barely budge. They didn't know it yet, but during this time a challenge even greater than both of these was being developed, and it was about to take the Geometry Dash scene by storm. After being inspired by the collab that he did with a well-known creator known as Wio Wio Tio, the creator G-Boy would take the hellish idea of Lake of Fire to his own editor where he would start developing and showing previews of his next masterpiece. When G-Boy finally released Cataclysm, he would immediately get questions by players asking how he could have verified such a beast. It was arguably harder than both Ice Carbon Diablo X and Alphabet X. G-Boy warded off these accusations with the largest attempt count dedicated to beating a single level in Geometry Dash history. Over 80,000. If this was what was needed to beat the extreme demons of the feature, then so be it. Many top players had their sights set on Cataclysm, knowing that whoever beat this now rated masterpiece would have their name engraved in the writings of Geometry Dash history. The players didn't know it yet, but the mere release of this level would spark the largest rivalry in Geometry Dash history. But that's a story to tell for another time. 
Alright, I hope you enjoyed this video. I still have many more ideas of documentaries that I could do not only involving Geometry Dash but also involving other things. If you want to keep up with updates more efficiently, the announcements channel in my Discord server is the best way to do that. Also, if you like the content, the best thing you could do is share my video. Exposure does wonders for my channel and I would definitely appreciate the support. Apart from that, there isn't a whole lot more I have to say. Make sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you all later. Goodbye.